Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lusk coming at you live from uh, Ten Sleep, Wyoming. Big ranch down here. I got uh, the opportunity to come and spend a little time here and see if I can help create a fisheries program on this beautiful ranch. Got to ride around here all day long. And I'm going to do this a little different than normal. I am uh, trying to do this from my laptop. I've just about come to the conclusion that if I don't have internet problems, then I got problems with my phone. So, let's see here. It says here, please set action needed. Holy cow. Huh, okay, it says maybe that the internet is too slow. I don't know what any of this means, so I'm going to keep on rolling and see if it works. Keyframe rate too low. Okay, well, I did a little test earlier today, and it seemed to be working just fine. Now, what I don't know how to do on this is to find your comments. So, I don't know how to play that game yet on my laptop, so I'm learning. Oh, here we go. Now I see it. All right, it looks like we don't have an audience, so if you guys are hearing me, then uh, let me know. Can't connect to the stream. Okay, James Allen, Jim Allen. Okay, there's Jason. Jason, Micah Trail. Okay, good. I'm seeing your comments now. So it looks like it's working. You know, I love this. I love learning how to do something while we're live. <laughs> so anyway, I'm hanging out south of Ten Sleep, Wyoming. Beautiful mountains, the Bighorn Mountains. It's uh, actually just stunningly beautiful. We, uh, I got to ride around with the owner and one of the project leaders here. To the Houston Johnson who brought me here and so I'm gonna spend another day here today we looked at live streams we looked at at several ponds and the mission is to see if we can figure out how to create a fun fishing program here in the Bighorn Mountains so I see John Funk from mid Michigan fall is fallen that's cool Monty Waddell from Illinois good to see you. hey Danny Mac checking in from San Antonio good to see everybody I'm glad you're able to see this that's cool. So tonight I'm going to try to talk about what I tried to talk about last week, which was should you stock fish this fall? So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Before I get into that, though, uh, I've got to post some pictures, which I will. Um, if I don't get it done today, I'll do it tomorrow on this thread so you can see what I'm doing, where I'm going, the travels, beautiful, beautiful country. Uh, we drove up on a herd of elk today. There was at least 150. I figured there were 80 or 90, but guys that know looked at me and said, no, 150. And it's really fun just to watch them because there's the herd bull, you know, and then there's younger bulls, and we I saw one bull that was limping. So he'd gotten into a fight or something and wasn't working out for him. So you guys know the drill. Hey, hashtag Pond Boss Magazine in the Doug Cusick just did it, so he's there. Uh, hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comments section. Click like. Share this to your timeline. You're eligible for drawing for a Palm Boss hat. And something else, whatever whatever Leanne conjures up in the office. You guys know what I'm going to say next. Palm Boss Magazine, $35 a year. Cheaper than a Friday night date. And it lasts a year. And it's full of nuggets. Full of all kinds of pond nourishment just for you. So, uh... I thought I'd talk about, and, and when I'm looking at it on my laptop, I can't tell how many people are on, so all I can see is who's commenting. So there's Jeremy Duckworth. Good to see you, Jeremy. So it looks like I'm getting your comments pretty live. All right, so here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about should you, should you stock fish in the fall? Uh, the question was posed to me by Dr. Mark Williams from Mountain Home, Arkansas, a couple of weeks ago. And he said, you know, I'm trying to make up my mind. Do I want to stock do I want to stock fish or do I want to wait? And if I do, then what do I need to do? Oh, Jim, you got on. Good to see you. 20 viewers. Okay. Hey, Kelly Duffy. Good to see you, buddy. Michael Gray checking in from Nashville, Tennessee. Jim Allen, Kentucky. Kelly Duffy, the Houston area. So uh, when Dr. Williams asked me that question, you know, I said, okay, so tell me, tell me where you are. So he's got a four-acre pond, and he has called over 100 bass this year. Hello, Fred Bigaman. Give Connie our best as well. So, uh, hey, Tommy, good to see you, buddy. And so, 
The uh, uh, Four Acre Pond, he's had several groups, especially uh, first responders have come out and fished his pond and he's, he's been selectively harvesting fish. So he's taken about 100 bass out of that four acre pond. He's concerned that he didn't get them out expeditiously enough to allow the bluegill to fill the voids in the food chain. Yeah, Mike Cottrell need to stock a little rain in your tank. Yeah, I get that. You need to be doing rain dances on a Wednesday night. So uh, uh, his question was, should I spend, you know, $1,000 or $600 or $2,000 on bait fish? What are the upsides and what are the downsides? So here's, here's what I'm going to tell you guys about this, and, and you guys will start bringing me some questions. So uh, what I told him was, you've removed 100 mouths from a four-acre pond. That's 25 per acre. A, a typical pond like that, a four-acre pond, can probably produce 60 to 75 pounds of largemouth bass per acre and sustain that many uh, over a long period of time. But what happens is, as the more individuals grow up in that system, then you have more fish and the average weight drops. So if, you, if you're harvesting fish, now you guys remember the five key, key components of pond management, same with me, happy water, great habitat, a food chain, 10 pounds of bait fish to support one pound of game fish, uh, good genetics for your part of the country. I'm here in Wyoming. There's no way I would tell them to bring largemouth bass from the south. And I'm not going to tell them to put largemouth bass up here anyway. It's cold water. So, you know, genetics is a big deal than a harvest plan. So the, the best thing after you get your pond like you want it is your harvest program. So Dr. Williams culled 25 bass from his lake, and he weighed and measured those fish and then let the guys fillet them. So now what he's doing is he's catching bass and he's monitoring their lengths and weights. Now, when you've got, uh, when you can measure and weigh some fish, you can compare those to standard to see if your fish are growing or not. And if your fish are gaining weight, then the food chain is pretty adequate. But one thing I told Mark was it'd be a good idea to go and, and do some trapping, maybe some seining, and see what kind of young of the year bait fish you've got going into the fall. Now, the fall's a big deal. The fall is more important than the spring, really, because the fall is when the fish feed voraciously. They're going to eat as much as they can. They're beginning to develop eggs for next year, and they're going to gain weight rapidly if they've got enough food. So what I told Mark was, since you've called so many fish, do a little sampling, see what you can find. If you can find three or four size classes of bluegills and find other forage fish like golden shiners or red ear sunfish, then you may not need to buy any fish for the fall. But if you didn't call any fish, go call some fish. If your food chain isn't, isn't adequate and you know it, then I look at stocking some fish. Now, there's two or three ways to look at that. One is you can put some fish in there that you think would serve as a fall and wintertime snack. And in that case, I'd be thinking about golden shiners. Now, the thing I like about golden shiners, there's things I don't like about golden shiners, but golden shiners, if, if you put in, you know, 20 pounds per acre, you know, it's 200 bucks, 250 bucks per acre that you're going to spend. So a four-acre pond, you'd spend $1,000. Now, what you're going to get out of that is you're going to get some immediate nourishment and some nourishment over the next 60 to 90 days, and then a handful of those shiners will make it through the winter and then reproduce next spring. So that could be a good idea. If your bluegill have just been annihilated, look at buying some adult bluegill to get one more spawn this fall. You know, if you're not feeding your fish, feed the fish. If you get out there with some good fish food, uh, Purina, Aquamax 500 or MVP, that's, those are two great feeds. Uh, you can grow some big bluegill pretty quick. You know, so look at that. See if you can do that. So I would spend time feeding fish. I would sample, but it is real important to make sure that your fish have an adequate food chain. Now, if you can't sample and you want to figure out if you have enough of a food chain, go weigh and measure some bass or your whatever game, small mouth, large mouth, and weigh them and measure them and compare that to standard. And if you're at least 100%, you're probably good to go. Then I wouldn't worry about it. I'd go into the fall, call a few more bass, be selective, call the fish that are underweight. And if you guys don't have that standard weight chart, let me know. Send me an email and I'll get, get it to you. 
So I see uh, Travis Smith checking in, Todd Austin's checking in. So I'm a little bit worried that we lost our audience the last couple of weeks because I wasn't able to get this done. So either way, you guys throw some questions at me or I'm going to have to think of another topic real quick. Let me think. Okay, let's talk about what I'm going to do here. <laughs> uh, this this man that owns this ranch is a businessman, but he's also he was all, he's also a rancher. He was raised, his grandfather was in the horse trading business. And so he grew up on the back of a horse. So he bought this ranch in part to make it a working ranch, which it is. And I was, I was hoping to broadcast from the back porch so you could see the scenery that I'm showing you. And uh, hey, Mike Cook, I know you need that chart. Send me an email because I, I won't go back and find it here. Just send me an email and say, hey, Bob, send me the weight chart. And I'll send that to you. So uh, anyway, uh, what, you, what you would be able to see over my shoulder right here is this gigantic red clay bluff. Then behind that, you can see the Bighorn Mountains. But down in the valley, he's got several alfalfa fields at the irrigate. And the aquifers here are amazing. Uh, there's water flowing just in springs coming out of the ground that are flowing 400 to 500 gallons per minute which is just stunning. That's a huge amount of water. And there's three aquifers that, that feed this artesian water flowing just out of the ground. So they're able to capture some of that water and gravity flow it and, and water these alfalfa fields. And here they're rolling the alfalfa up in big round bales because they're going to hang on to them to feed the cattle. So they're running cattle. They got this huge herd of elk. You know, they, they look at the elk as a pest <laughs> because they come in and, and eat, you know, eat the grass and eat their alfalfa and tear up the trees and things like that. So uh, anyway, what we're looking at is how can we take some of these beautiful pristine streams and ensure that there's areas in those streams that trout will live. And there's several of these streams that flow into or around some larger ponds or reservoirs that capture water for irrigation. So what can we do with some of those ponds to turn those into some pretty fun uh, fishing ponds as well. You know, and fishing's not the only thing. There's a pond right in front of the house which sits up on top of a, a I'm going to call it a knoll, but it's really not. It's taller than that. When you look down on that pond and there's a dock, there's a ladder where they can swim and climb in and out. There's a beach. So what he's wanting to do, he and his wife are put together a, a recreational program for invited guests to be able to hike, enjoy, rest, uh, recover, relate, build relationships, and if they catch a trout, they can cook it, you know. And so it's it's just it's just it's a fun challenge, and I've already got some ideas. So let's see here. Let me see here. Danny Mac, I think big bass find that little bass are better to eat than bluegills. Yes, they do. You know, uh, the bigger a bass gets, the bigger its meal is. So. You know, a five-pound bass would chow down on a nine, 10, 11 inch bass. An eight-pound bass will eat a pound and a half bass. And you know, an eight or nine pound bass will eat a 12 inch gizzard shad. So big fish eat big meals. So uh, let's see, Danny Mac says, I'm gonna be giving his predators about six pounds of shiners a fall treat. I expect to get red ear catfish and some more hybrid strappers in another week. There you go. I see Scott and Leah checking in from outside of Beggs, Oklahoma. Good to see you guys. Travis has been remodeling, going to church and remodeling the house. So uh, here he is. I'm glad to see Travis back in here checking in. <laughs> Bought a house in June, thought it sounded like a good idea. <laughs> What's the best size? Adam, good question. What's the best size to stock bluegills from a hatchery pond? Um, now, if you're raising your own bluegills, I'm going to tell you stock all sizes because you're, you're, you're gonna do two things with that. The, when you've got your own hatchery pond and you can sane it or trap it, stock all sizes because the more fish you take out of that hatchery pond, the more fish that are gonna be replaced when they reproduce again. So you're harvesting a crop to get ready for the next crop and, and you're not necessarily trying to be real picky about the size of bluegills that you put in to feed your hungry bass. So the other, other piece of that is if you're, if you're if your resources are, are finite or limited, you've got a certain budget, then you need to stock bluegill that are just about too big to be eaten, but you want some of them to be eaten, and you want some of them to be able to grow up fast enough that they can reproduce and help, help replenish your declining bluegill stocks. 
that's another reason it's a good idea to uh, to do some sampling. Let's see here. Travis, hope that, you know, Travis, you're always loving on my family, and I appreciate that. Debbie's back in Texas. She's got one of the grandkids. She's got little Hadley, who I swear is a mini Debbie. As a matter of fact, she's going to dress up like little Debbie at Halloween. That's going to be kind of fun. But we've got 13 grandkids, and Debbie's created a, a haven there along the uh, Brazos River, and grandkids just come every chance they get, and she's got one. Um, let's see, Jason Rayfield, you know what, I'm going to hit Jim out. Any updates on aging the fish with the students? I'm waiting on that fishing club to make a decision. I've got, I've got everything in motion. I'm just waiting on them to decide which option they want to go with. Uh, Mark Cornwell up at Cobble Skill, New York, He's ready to go to work on it. You know, I'm ready to help orchestrate it. And we're just waiting for the decision makers because I think they've got a couple of, couple of um, internal issues they're trying to deal with within the club structure itself. But I expect them to make that decision here pretty quick. I'm going to be, be riding on them pretty hard because it's time to be doing that. Jason Rayfield, when should I stop feeding my bluegill here on North Kakalak around winter? Is there a certain water temperature I should look for when it's time to stop? I'll tell you what I do, Jason. Now, I don't, I don't know how big your pond is, but what I'm going to tell you is the bluegill will tell you when they're ready to quit feeding. Their, uh, their feeding aggression will, will diminish. They'll, uh, there won't be as many coming to the feeder. Now, if one of your goals is to grow big, big bluegills, and if you've got a little bit of a flow rate in that pond, especially if you're in the black water and the water's flowing pretty good, I'd still feed a little bit. I'd still set that feeder to go off maybe two seconds a day, once a day, you know, over the entire winter because some of those fish are going to gonna eat that fish food. You know, now, here's, here's the reality of that. About 55 degrees, they slow down. And by 46 degrees, they pretty well shut down, you know. So you won't see them feeding aggressively much below 55 degrees, but they pretty well stop feeding intentionally and where you can be assured of it at 46. Now, they're going to feed at 38 if they're hungry. It's just that as the water temperature drops, so does their metabolism rate. They don't metabolize as fast. Their feed requirements drop, and so they don't feed as much. So keep bringing those questions, guys. This is very helpful. <laughs> You know, next week I'm going to get to go see. Uh, uh, I'm going to get to go go to the memorial, the life memorial service for Ray Scott. I'm going to tell you a Ray Scott story here in a minute. Travis, how's the project for the veterans coming? I haven't heard anything lately. It's moving along really, really well. Uh, that's Heroes Ranch. Take a look at Heroes Ranch. I think it's HeroesRanch.org, and they're making some good progress. They've got the. Uh, Main house renovated. They get the cabin renovated. The lakes are renovated. They're waiting on water to stock fish. It's high fence. There's a berm all the way around the outside where the road is. So, and, and they've had some guests. So they're posting things on their Facebook page. And look at their website as well. So look up uh, Heroes Ranch. That's a very, very cool project. I'm proud to be a, a little bitty part of that. So let's see, Ben says, uh, is it possible to use the Texas Hunter fish feeders for deer in the wintertime wanting to use corn to save money? Absolutely, you bet. Sure, there's no, no problem with that at all. Just fix it where the hogs can't knock it over. Hello, Michael Eric, good to see you. Let's see, um, let's see here. Is a throw net a good option for sampling bait fish? Yeah, it's a good option. The only thing I don't like about a throw net is that... Um, uh oh, let me see something. I got something going on here. Is is that um, filament, um, uh, monofilament, is can be hard on them sometimes, especially if you've got little bitty fish. I like saning better because the net's soft, which that may sound a little, a little goofy, but it's easier on the fish. However, yes, you can use a cast net to be to do some sampling. Doctor. Howard Dicker, when do you turn the aerator off in Tennessee? I don't think you need to run your aerator. Now, you know, there's, there's a, I read Outdoor Water Solutions uh, monthly newsletter today, and they're saying that they, they like to see water moving all winter so it doesn't ice over. I would rather see it ice over myself because that's part of the way nature does it. So here's what I'm going to tell you. 
by the time the water hits 55 degrees, it's turned over, you know, it, it's autonomous top to bottom, it's saturated with oxygen, and you don't need that aeration system going anymore. Now, if you live in the north and you're subject to a winter kill, then we need to have a different talk. Because there are cases when I do think that an aeration system can be beneficial, but you don't use it in the wintertime the same way that you use it in the summertime. So there's a strategy change. But the direct answer to that question is uh, 55 degrees. Turn it off by 55 degrees. Takes two people to run saying, yeah, Doug, I see what you're saying. So a cast net would be fine in that case. Okay, let's see. Todd Stegner says, how do I know when I need to feed the fish? And if I need a feeder, when's the best time to start? Before winter or after? Bass are slightly ahead of the growth curve. And most bluegills are two to five inches or in the lake by the thousands. So, Todd, here's what I'm going to tell you. I don't remember where you live, but uh, like if, if you're south of a line drawn through um, Oklahoma City to Nashville, Tennessee, going up through Charlotte, North Carolina, and up toward where Billy Bates is in Maryland, about the second or third week of March is a good time to start kicking the feeder on and just feed a little bit. You don't need to feed a lot, just feed a little bit. Now, what will happen, Todd, over the winter with your good growth curve going on, the bass feeding well, they're going to chow down on a bunch of those little bluegills this fall and over the winter, even though you're feeding them. You may get one more spawn before the fall ends and you get into winter, but there, you're, a lot of those uh, bait fish are going to get eaten because that's what they're supposed to do, and it makes room for the, the bigger ones to reproduce again next spring. So if you fed them really well, feed them until the water temperature gets to about 55, and then when the water temperature hits 55 again next spring, Wherever you are, that's a good time to kick the feeder back on. So in, in most parts of the south of that Mason-Dixon line, kind of, um, you'd be looking at uh, the second or third week of March, typically. But if you want to measure the temperature, look at 55 degrees. So Billy Bay says, is sinking feed better in the warmer temps? I like some sinking all summer anyway, but is that a good tactic to extend the late feeding? Um... Let's see. Yeah, okay. You like some, is it better in cooler temps? You know, it depends on what kind of fish you're feeding. It's, this is kind of a strange little factoid, but bluegill don't necessarily like to pick feed up out of the mud. Now, I'm not saying they don't feed on the bottom because they will. They'll eat bugs and things. But if that sinking feed hits the mud, they're probably not going to pick it up. But your catfish will. So if you've got catfish, yeah, you can extend the feeding season a little bit. But what I would do is I would really bump up the feed now and let those fish eat as much as they can. And then when they slow way, way, way down, just cut your feeder back. But you can feed a little bit of, of sinking feed. Just I don't, I've just, I've watched enough bluegills feed. They just won't go dig it out of the mud. And if they won't, then it's, if, it's, if the catfish don't eat it, then it's wasted. And then that starts to affect your water quality. So let's see here. Let me see if I can get this going so I can read it. Let's see here. I'm going to have to hit my little mouse. Okay. Yep. Adam Harkness was typing the same question. Um... I'm going to tell you that you're probably, you're probably, depending on the species you're feeding, you may be wasting some money. <laughs> hey, there's R.E. Thompson checking in from Mississippi. Pedal, Mississippi, good to see you. He's in his, R.E. is about 113 years old. No, he's in his 80s, and he's probably the most active 80-year-old that I've never met. Uh, I feel like he's been a friend of mine forever. So, uh, Dave Weber, my metabolism slows down below 55 degrees. Also, yes, so does mine. <laughs> hey, it's pretty nice and cool up here in Wyoming, I'm here to tell you. It's not, it's not bad. Central Missouri, Todd. Okay, so I'm going to tell you your fish will probably start feeding again around the third week of, uh, of March through there somewhere. Greg Baird, dude, if I had a... Had a drum roll for you, a little rim shot. I'd, I'd play it for you right now. What did the fish say when he hit the wall? Damn. <laughs> Thompson says, does turning off the fuses go the same way? 
Can't believe my pond is so green. Does this late bloom still help the food chain? Yes, it does. So here's, here's what I'm going to tell you. I would not turn my diffusers off now because your, our temperatures are dropping and your diffusers are going to help manage that plankton bloom. They're going to help keep the blue-green algae this time of year at bay. You're going to get a late bluegill spawn, so that'll feed their babies. So I would keep the diffusers on until the temperature hits 55 degrees. Then I'd turn them off. Tony Edwards, Eclectic, Alabama. Good to see Tony. You know what? I'm going to pause now and do a little commercial. No, I'm not. I'm going to answer a couple questions. Texas Hunter advised the corn might fall faster than fish food and outrun the fan. If that happens, might need to adjust the baffle. That is a good point. Good point, Scott. That a boy. That's a, I didn't think about that, but that's absolutely true. So uh, if you have a Texas Hunter feeder, just give them a call. Uh, I'm telling you, they are so friendly and so service oriented that uh, they're going to, that's a good question. If you don't know how to change or adjust the baffle, Give them a call because they will absolutely help you with that. They're, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up. James, Jam Allen, any idea whether crayfish eat MVP? If they do, I won't feel, feel so bad. Yes, you know what? They will. They will. If they know it's there, if they can smell it, which crawfish have a pretty good sensory system, uh, and they will, daggum sure, get in the riprap and eat it. They absolutely will. I've watched them do that. They like it. Once in... in they're not smart enough to know that they need to be there every day. Okay, shellcrackers will pick it up if the bluegills train them. <laughs> There's a uh, Ron Ardway. Good to see Ron. Ron's getting ready to get some fish brought down to South Louisiana. Sure, I'm glad that hurricane turned. I sure hate that it turned on Florida. Justin Ludwig has seen crawfish eat Aquamax. I believe that. Jay Tyra. Bob, I have a tiny pond that my wife planted a lot of water lilies in. Put a couple of pounds of fatheads to integral feeders. Do you have a way to get the fatheads out without ruining your plants? I would love to be able to put them. Yeah, you can uh, set a set a trap. It's real easy to trap those. Now the thing is, you're going to have to use. Uh, I would go to um, like a local bait shop or even some of the box stores, Bass Pro Shops, Walmart. I have bought minnow traps. You can buy them online from Amazon, but you can buy minnow traps that are Teflon coated hardware cloth. And you can bait them with fish food, you know, and, and the way I do it, when I set a trap, I'll run down to the Dollar General store and go buy a pair of pantyhose, and I'll cut the foot off and just stuff that foot, the toe of that foot, full of fish food, then tie a knot in it. Then I'll tie it in the middle part of the minnow trap so it's suspended in the minnow, middle. And if you've been feeding your minnows, those fatheads, they know what that, fat, what that fish food smells like, and they'll come on those traps, and you can trap them without messing up the the plants. You sure can. Let's see what else. There's something else that Jay had here that, let me see. It says see more. Okay. All right. Gotcha. All right. Uh, John Pearson. Oops. I'm getting a little behind. Pond water down two feet. Bushy pond weed took advantage of the shallow banks in a one acre pond. Is there any dangers going into falling Kentucky waiting for the rain? Pond down two feet. Bushy pond weed took advantage of the shallow banks. 30% coverage and went. I don't think you've got any dangers going into fall. The, the, when, now, when you ask me that question, what I'm thinking about is, is there are there issues with that pond weed where they're going to cause problems with water quality? I don't see that happening for you. I don't. And I tell you what, what it has happened. It's been a nursery ground for baby bait fish, so that's a real big positive. But I don't. I just I can't. I can't think of an issue. Now, if it's, if it's covering 30% of the entire pond, then it might be wise here, if you don't get some rain, to pull some of it out and just let it dry up on the bank. If you mean 30% coverage, so in other words, if 30% if of the entire pond is covered, then yeah, I, I think just, just, I don't think you're going to have any issues, but just to hedge your bets, then think about getting a rake and pulling some of it out as it starts to go dormant. Hello, Harrison Davis. 
I uh, hope you got to read Bill Cody's emails back and forth to us about microscopes and silt and water. Doug Cusick, my fish in South Central Kansas normally feed fish food. Uh-oh. Let's see here. Um, until about November when the water starts getting below. That's it. There you go. That's right. That's right. Ron got Brandon Cash staying at the Caban. Oh, my gosh. You better watch out for that. Yep. 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 Walter is great. Those cheap air temperature control switches I put on the aerator cutting off on the air is over 85 or under 65. I'm looking to hold the 70s water temperature as long as possible. Worked well. Now, see, that's another brilliant thing. It's one of my favorite things about Danny Mac. He thinks about this stuff. He kind of raises the layers of his pond, you know, like peeling back an onion. And he's done some pretty cool electronic stuff to, to help. He under, Danny Mac understands what happy water means. He pumps his water, he moves it, he's got a, you know, a small system, but it's a, a stunningly beautiful system, and he shouldn't keep his water in the 70s. Now, if you can do that, San Antonio, Texas, after we've gone through 90 days where most of them were over 100 degrees, you did good. So, hey, speaking of doing good, Palm Boss Magazine, 35 bucks a year right here, 35 bucks a year, full of nuggets, cheaper than a Friday night date, and it lasts a year. <laughs> and uh, hashtag Palm Boss Magazine click like share to your timeline eligible for drawing for Palm Boss Hat it's about time we did a, do a drawing so won't be long I do also want to brag about our sponsors uh, Easy Docs of Texas David Schneiderman uh, Purina Mills I love Purina Mills they, they make great products but one of my favorite things about them is they've allowed me to work with them to to give them ideas on what they can do with research and development to continue to create good products and actually great products. And uh, they're very anxious to help please the, the fish food market. And do they have their hiccups? Yeah, every big company has their hiccups. But you cannot argue about the quality of their fish food. Texas Hunter Feeders, Chris and Cody and, and all those, Dale Baden, all those guys down there, they will bend over backwards to help you. So not only are their products astonishingly stellar, that's redundant, isn't it? Astonishingly stellar. I don't know where that came from, but I said it. Uh, but so is their customer service. And I love those guys. They're just, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, you could buy one feeder from them, you can buy 100 feeders from them, doesn't matter. If you bought a feeder from them and you got a question, you ring their number, they're going to answer it. And I hear that over and over and over. Um, also, hey, if you like to hunt, go check out huntbirddog.com. Now, for full transparency, my son is one of the founders of that company, but I'm pretty proud of him because he's come up with a, a brilliant idea. Now, I don't know if it's a new idea, but it's new to me, and it's working really, really well. So what he's, back in February, he came up with the idea, you know, he says, Dad, I, I, I really like to hunt, but... You know, if, if I don't have a lease here in Texas, then I need to work with an outfitter unless I have a friend that will let me hunt. And I said, you know, Jonathan, that's really right. I mean, if you're going to if you're gonna book an outfitter, you need to go to the Dallas Safari Club or Texas Trophy Hunters and, and go to their trade shows and find people. And you'll spend time online looking for ranches for lease. And, and now the leases have gotten to be a pain in the neck because these landowners want you to buy liability policies that cover them. And I was asking one of the leasees here a few months ago, tell me how that works. He says, well, here's how it works. If some cattle get out of his land and a truck hits them, your policy's got to cover them. I said, you know, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. You know, so what Jonathan did, Jonathan Lusk, huntbirddog.com, was he came up with the idea of creating a company that books ranches, little known ranches, and he actually is creating like a VRBO, Airbnb concept for hunting. So there may be some, some ranches out there where the, the family doesn't really want people leasing their land coming on it, but they don't mind having a couple of events each year. So Jonathan works with that ranch to set up those events, their accommodations, you know, the way the experience works. So he's created a pretty cool company. So when we get finished here, you guys go check out huntbirddog.com. It's a pretty interesting concept. They did an alligator hunt last week 
I think, uh, or yeah, it was last weekend, or weekend before last, outside of Lake Charles, Louisiana there, Ron. Worked with a, a group of guys there. It was pretty good gum cool because what they did was they they hunted alligators and they then they went to the Horseshoe Casino for gambling, <laughs> which I thought was a brilliant marketing idea. Well, with the, I think they had like twelve hunters, and they went with their with their guides who set twenty five alligator lines. They caught one hundred and sixteen alligators, one hundred and sixteen. So the guides got to keep the hides and whatever they wanted, and then everybody got, you know, some alligator meat to take home with them and an experience that they'll be bragging about for a long, long time. So huntbirddog.com. Uh, he's got some, and when you click on that website, you'll see all the different hunting opportunities. He's got like father-son, uh, mother-daughter, father-daughter hunts. You know, go take your first doe, and they're, they're, they're moderately priced. You know, you can go, you can go take a doe with your, with a grandson for 1200 bucks or something. Okay, let's see here. Let me go back to some questions here. Todd says, when should you start culling fish to keep them growing, and what size do you cull first? That's a great question. Let me tell you how I approach that. And, and I, we're probably talking about largemouth bass because that's what most of this audience likes to know about. So what you do there... Is, is weigh and measure some fish and compare your fish to standards. So in other words, a 10-inch bass should weigh 10 ounces. 12-inch bass should weigh 12 ounces. A 16-inch bass should weigh 2 pounds and a quarter. 18-inch bass, 3 and a quarter. So you weigh and measure a, a good representative sample of your fish, and if you find, what you're going to find typically is there'll be a size range. Most of the time it's like 10 to 14-inch bass in a pond that's at least 3 years old or older that uh, that are starting to lose weight. Now, in, in order for a 16-inch bass to be 16 inches, it's got to weigh two and a quarter pounds. So if you got 16-inch bass that weigh a pound and a half, they've lost weight. You know, if your 12-inch bass weigh 10 ounces, they've lost weight. So monitor your fish, and what you'll see is it'll be a slot size of fish that are beginning to lose weight. Now, I can send you that spreadsheet. You guys send me an email at info at pondboss.com. It said, just in there, say, hey, Bob, I'd like to have the bass spreadsheet. So you can weigh and measure some fish, plug them into that spreadsheet, and it's going to show how your fish compare to standards. I uh, got to work on a lake last week where it looked to me like that lake had just been freshly stocked. But it hadn't. So all the fish had grown to about 9, 10, 11, 12 inches, and they just stopped. And some of those fish were four years old. So in that case... Every bass 12 inches and under needs to come out. Now, the biologist did see a couple of fish that were in the 4 to 5 pound size range in that lake, but there's just not enough of them. So, to answer your question, when should you start culling fish to keep them growing, and what size do you cull first? If it's a newly stocked pond at, at toward the end of the third year or the beginning of the fourth year, and you're typically culling 14-inch bass and smaller, so that's a safe recommendation because if you've got a, a pond that's three years old and your bass aren't to 14 inches yet, some of them, they need to come out because they're, they're probably males or underachievers. And that being the case, they need to call. Now, I am going to tell you to be selective, selectively harvest. Don't take every bass that you catch that's within that slot. If you catch one that looks like a, what, what uh, uh, Ray Scott used to call an Alabama deputy sheriff, throw it back. So uh, speaking of that, I told you I was going to tell you a story, a Ray Scott story, and I'm going to be at his memorial service on the 4th in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, I got to spend a lot of time with that guy, and he was always doing something funny. Uh, he, I, I'll tell you this. He's one of the few guys that I could sit and listen to talk about himself for hours. His stories were so enthralling and entertaining. Now, one time I went with him, we went and looked at the lake over uh, in Alabama, south of Macon. I mean, uh, Georgia, south of Macon, Georgia, Eastman, Georgia, I think it was. And we were running around with a guy who uh, who saw Ray as, as the superstar that he was. So he was, wanted to show him around town a little bit. So we went and had lunch at a local cafe, got to eat some soul food. And that was one of Ray's favorites. He loved He had a little uh, place in Montgomery where he loved to go eat soul food. And, uh, but anyway, this fella in, in Georgia knew that, so he took him to a little cafe. 
So we ate there, had a little smorgasbord, so we got to pick out whatever we wanted. We ate, and then afterwards, there was a beauty shop right next to the cafe. So uh, this landowner said, hey, Ray, I want, I want you to meet some people. So he takes him into this beauty shop, and there's some stunningly beautiful women in there. Uh, I noticed something a little different about them. They were, they were beautiful, but they looked kind of rugged, if, if you guys know what I mean. And two of them had their husbands in there. So Ray looked at them, greeted them, turned around, and said, hey, you got a quarter? And I said, yeah, I reached in my pocket. I gave him a quarter. So he's looking at all these people, talking to them, listening to them, you know, doing work in the crowd, working it good. And there were probably 10 people. So uh, he walks up to this beautiful blonde-headed lady with her husband, and he looks at her, and he holds up my quarter, and he says, Honey, I bet you I can kiss you so lightly on your cheek that you won't feel it. And she blushed. She looked at her husband. Her husband says, yeah. And she said, well, what'd you say? He said, honey, I bet you I can kiss you so lightly on your cheek that you can't feel it. She said, okay. So Ray reaches over, plants a big sloppy kiss right on her cheek, pushes her head over. He said, did you feel it? She says, yeah. He said, well, here's your quarter. Gave him my quarter. Ray Scott, love that guy. So, uh, Let's see here. Let's see what Jim's saying. We're working with the county on re redesigning silt ponds based on Q critical, the flow that transports silt instead of two or ten or hundred year storm events. Ever hear of this? No, I haven't heard of that, but I like that idea a lot because the flow rate that transports silt is one of the critical factors that causes our ponds to age. You know, I mean, the minute that you build a pond and silt starts flowing into it, and it happens with every single one of them, because where dirt is disturbed, dirt will move. So I do think it's, I, I, I like, I'd like to hear more about it as you, as you do it. Doug, I'm wanting to try some tilapia next year for algae control and added forage, but I've been having a hard time finding them. Any suggestions on a supplier near Kansas? You know what? Um, remind me next spring, but we've had I've had several people in Kansas call me wanting to find some tilapia, and I know that they're legal in Kansas. You know, so I bet you there's a couple of suppliers. I know American Sport Fish uh, hauls a lot of tilapia in the springtime, and if they could get an order big enough and make sure that they get their permits, I know they'd go to Kansas. They just got to have a big enough order. Let's see here. Danny Mac, the water got to 85.2 one late afternoon this summer. Stayed below 85 otherwise. There you go. Um, Justin says try Harbin. I, you know, Harbin, Harbin may be a good choice. I, I have not talked to the Harbin fish farm in Kansas. I talk to the one in Oklahoma all the time. But that would be a good choice because if, if they don't have some, they should probably be able to get some. Okay, Bob, I don't care about largemouth bass, but I'd like to know when and what to call for bluegills. Okay, well, uh, um, okay, look at there, Linda Welch. Jeff is Googling huntbirddog.com right now. There it is. You know what, Linda, Jeff's a pretty good candidate. You might be too, because you guys check that out, because it's very affordable stuff. Okay, so Michael doesn't care about, you, you better care about largemouth bass, because they're going to be a key part of you having bluegills to call. Because uh, if you don't have bass in there with your bluegills, then their numbers are going to get out of hand and their growth rate's going to slow down. But if you want to go cull some bluegills, be sure that you don't over-harvest the adults. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Don't take out your biggest bluegills. Protect them. But if you want to take the next size down, you can sure take 30 or 40 pounds per acre through the course of a year, even up to 100 if you're feeding them well. And I, I'm pretty convinced that you're feeding them well. Uh, then you can be calling some bluegills. But if your biggest bluegills are eight inches long, take out the sixes and maybe a few sevens. But leave the eights alone. So set that standard now, and I'll tell you why. Those bigger bluegill are the ones that defend the nests best of all the other fish. In order for other bluegills to take their place, they have to get big enough to run them off. So uh, your culling should be not the biggest bluegill, but the next size down. And use the bass to help call the smallest bluegills. Then you'll get more bluegills to get bigger. There we go. 
Harrison Davis, can a largemouth bass with a 90% relative weight or lower all year long grow? Yes, they can grow. They can grow. Here's the problem. If they've been at, at, at a relative weight below 90% for a long time, then their topside potential is gone. So uh, that's the problem. So if they've been like at 75 or 80% for a year, their growth potential is shot. You might as well call them. But if they're 90%, and I'll tell you when you're going to see 90%. 90% is right after the spawn. Because you see all these big girls that just give, you know, lay their eggs out there, and the males that don't feed, and they're sitting on the nest hatching eggs, those fish are going to lose weight in the springtime. So, you know, in the fall, you're, you're, you're going to be seeing some fish with some good relative weights. But in the spring, and then even going through the summer some, you're going to see some with lower relative weights till the food chain builds up and they can really gain weight in the fall. So now if you're catching some in, in uh, late October, early November, and they're at 80 to 90%, take them out because they don't make the cut. Let's see here. Jim Allen, anyone know of a reasonably priced remote Wi-Fi battery operated lake water temp sensor that I can connect to from my phone? Harrison Davis says, yes, we do. I think he's answering that. Um, yeah, Hartley doesn't have any. Hartley doesn't do that. Hartley's not much on. Hartley, Hartley's been around. Hartley, I'll tell you, I've got some pretty cool stories about Hartley Well, as well. See, back when I first started, back in 1980, the state of Texas stopped giving away free fish to stock ponds, so I, I saw a niche that I could fill and would be fun. Well, there were no sport fish hatcheries in Arkansas like there are now, and there weren't any small ones to speak of around the country. Kingman, Kansas, Hartley Fish Farm is about the best place I could go to get largemouth bass and bluegills. Now, I could get Florida bass from Ocala, Florida, but that's a long way. We had to air freight those in. And copper nose bluegill from there, I could get channel catfish and fathead minnows from Lone Oak. You know, and I got to meet Buss Hartley when he was way up in years. He was in his 70s, probably back in the early 80s. And I learned more from that guy. I learned more about how to handle fish. And uh, I got to say this about Buss Hartley. He was the first guy to figure out how to artificially spawn catfish with survival rates. Now, a lot of guys could figure out how catfish would spawn, but there weren't very many early on in the late 50s, early 60s that could figure out how to keep the babies alive, and Buss Hartley did that. And then he was able to spread that information and help, help do his part to create an industry. You know, and, and I don't think he gets enough credit for that, so here's some credit to Buss Hartley and now his sons, who all have hair the same color as mine, you know, my beard, you know, and uh, holy cow, those, those guys have been influential, but... But they stay within their zone, stay in their lane, stay in their niche. So let me see here. I got three inches of rain. Jeff Wallen, luckily water was green, had quarter inch like hair everywhere up to a foot down. That, that was a type of, of uh, dying filamentous algae. So when you got that three inches of rain, that hair like stuff, is, is algae, but it's, it's going to go away. It's a different species of algae, but that will dissipate. Don't treat it. Let it, let it do what it's going to do. It'll go away. Greg Russell, North Louisiana, Four Acre Pond, his bass, copper nose brim, red ear, put 10,000 thrift in shad in July, had too many bass, caught and cleaned every skinny bass, threw every fat bass back. I feed Purina Aquamax three times a day for 15 seconds at a time. I think I need to take more bass before the fall. I don't really know. What else can I do? Weigh and measure them. I mean, you're doing everything right. You're doing everything right. I mean, you're, you're, you're getting a Pondmeister of the year right now. Here we go. You're doing it all. So I would, uh, I would uh, keep calling some bass. If you're catching bass that are underweight with everything you've done, keep calling. You know, here's the thing about culling bass. Here's another real important point. The more bass you cull, the more bass replace them. The difference is, is when you're culling bass that are underweight, a bass that's not overweight is going to take their place in that slot. So you, not only are you taking away a competing mouth, you're making room for another competing mouth to come in and fill that gap. So culling should be an ongoing process. Dave Weber, what do the fish hatcheries do with all the fish at the end of the stocking year with all their own unsold fish? I'll tell you, the last couple of years there haven't been many. You know, most of the time they carry them over because they know in the springtime they're going to need those fish to, to sell to their regular customers. 
So what they'll do is they'll do their best to keep the predators off of them, keep the cormorants away, keep the uh, swans and pelicans away from them, manage the river otters the best they can, and hope that they come out of the winter, you know, without a harsh weather problem, you know, with heavy floods and snow and rain and, and uh, heavy uh, ice, cold, frigid temperatures that can kill fish, you know, because all those hatchery ponds are, are shallow. So what they do is they carry them through the winter, take care of them the best they can, they shut down at Thanksgiving, and they all go hunting. Then they don't get back until after the first of the year. So they go through the holidays, they go whitetail deer hunting, whatever they want to do, they go do that. And then they crank back up and start protecting those fish through the winter so they can have them to sell in the spring. It's part of what they do. Kenny Sanderson, snipe on the palm bus for him, speaks highly of Orbit. Harbin. Yes, he does. Matter of fact, Kenny, Kenny Sanderson, he comes on this show quite often. He may be on here now. We just hadn't heard from him. Let's see. Jim Allen, my brother has a 33-foot diameter growing dome with a 3,500-gallon tank for managing temperature. He's putting in channel catfish and bluegill. Is there a better choice? Uh, no. No. No, there's not. Uh, a better choice is let them grow in the pond. <laughs> so a uh, 33-foot diameter growing with a 3,500-gallon tank, managing temperature. Yep, okay, so he can grow those fish. He's just going to have to pay attention to aeration and water quality because if the aerator quits for 20 minutes and he's got a standing crop in there that can consume the oxygen, they're going to die. But I like his thinking. You know, the, the thing is, is he can get some growth rates on them to put him into a pond for next year. But a better choice for putting into a 3,500-gallon tank, channel catfish and bluegill are good choices. Uh, tilapia can be a good choice if they're legal and you got a reason for them. Harrison Davis from Georgia. He knows what I'm saying about those rugged ladies. They're uh, they're really pretty, but I, I, learned, I learned about them later. Um, it, I think some of it's genetic. <laughs> So here we are, we're 722. We have any more questions, hit them to me really quick. Just remember, uh, Palm Moss Magazine, $35 a year. Cheaper than a Friday night date. And uh, go to huntbirddog.com and see what you think. And then after you look at it, come back on here and put some comments on it. I'd like to hear what you think about it. And uh, when I get a few minutes, I'll post up some pictures of what I'm looking at. So uh, I'm not through taking pictures. I'm going to be here tomorrow and then probably head out on Friday. So uh, anyway, I'm going to cut it loose right here. I'm glad we made it through an entire show. I'm glad you all came. I do appreciate that. Uh, Travis, yes, I am working up here. I'm working with this rancher to uh, help figure out what we can do for a fishing program for some live streams and some live ponds, actually. So that's what's going on. So hey, listen, I really do appreciate you guys checking in and uh, hanging out with me tonight. And uh, I don't know where I, I don't see next Wednesday. I think I'm going to be somewhere else rather than home. I don't know where I'm going to be, but I know this. I'm going to do everything I can to be with you guys. If I got a good internet connection and I'm going to go back and look at this video right here. And if it turned out okay, I'm going to do it again like this because it seems like it worked. So until then, I appreciate all you guys. Adios.